Hello and welcome to Cinematic Excrement. At long last, we have reached the end of our journey through the worst Hollywood has to offer, as well as some of the worst jokes the Golden Raspberry Foundation has to offer. This is, as of 2023, the most recent winner of the Razzie for Worst Picture. It comes to us courtesy of Netflix, much like the previous year's winner. Gentlemen, ladies, and non-binary daisies, I give you Blonde. Released in 2022 to Netflix after a very limited theatrical release, Blonde is based on the novel of the same name by Joyce Carol Oates, which was published way back in 2000. It is very loosely based on the life and times of Marilyn Monroe, and stars Ana de Armas as the blonde bombshell. And it has the distinction of being one of the few NC-17 movies I've reviewed. So if there are any kids watching this video, your parents seriously need to pay better attention to what you're doing online. In fact, I'd like a word with them. Pause this video and go get them. Are they here? Good. Parents, come here. Come here. Now, what's the matter with you? You're just letting your kids wander the internet unsupervised? Do you have any idea what a dangerous place this is? There is so much crazy shit on the internet. There's white supremacists, flat earthers, pickup artists, gender criticals, People who thought Justice League was a good movie. This is not the kind of stuff that young, impressionable minds should be exposed to. Do better. Reportedly, Blonde received a 14-minute standing ovation when it premiered at the Venice International Film Festival, but critical and audience reception following its official release was very much mixed. While some critics thought it was exploitative drivel, others gave it a positive review, including people I still have a fair amount of respect for despite their recent lapse in judgment. Hey, nobody bats a thousand. You want proof? Read the comments! The movie was nominated for eight Razzies last year, but thanks to some stiff competition, only managed to take home two. Worst screenplay for Andrew Dominic, who also directed the film but lost that category to Machine Gun Kelly, no really, and Worst Picture. The Razzies made a few mistakes that year, as they do pretty much every year. I've already talked about their nominating Ryan Kira Armstrong for Firestarter, which they retracted after rather strong feedback and rightfully so. And ultimately, the Razzies gave the Worst Actress Award to themselves. Also, I'm not sure Tom Hanks deserved Worst Supporting Actor for Elvis. Worst Accent? Sure, I can buy that. He sounds nothing like the real Colonel Tom Parker. Even your own daddy has looked after himself before he's looked after you. We have supported each other. Because we share the dream. He sounds like Adam Sandler doing an impression of Dusty Rhodes. But I wouldn't say a bad accent necessarily means a bad performance. Hell, out of all the nominees for Worst Supporting Actor, Maud Son from Good Morning is probably the only one who actually deserved it. But as far as Worst Picture, this year the Razzies gave it to the right movie. I don't think the other nominees even come close, though I can see why they deserve nominations at least. We had Disney's Pinocchio, which the Razzies were careful to distinguish from Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio a live-action remake that no one was asking for, and a poor substitute for the original. Also starring Tom Hanks. He did not have a very good year. We had Good Morning, which is a late 90s stoner comedy. Unfortunately, it was released in 2022. Yeah, it had a few funny cameos from Danny Trejo and Pete Davidson, but that's about all it had going for it. We had The King's Daughter, which answers the question, what if a Disney princess movie was written by monkeys? It had an interesting premise, but boy, the execution was off. I hear the book is better. And finally, Morbius. If I have to explain why this one deserved a nomination, congratulations on finally coming out of your coma! But while none of those movies were very good, Blonde was terrible and easily the most deserving of Worst Picture honors. Let's take a look at why, shall we? Our story begins in L.A. with a young pre-stage name Norma Jean Baker and her mother Gladys, played respectively by Lily Fisher and Julianne Nicholson. The latter appears to have a few screws loose as she shows her daughter a picture of Clark Gable and claims he's her father, though she refuses to say his name for God knows what reason. Then the Griffith Park fire of 1933 breaks out and Gladys decides the best course of action is to drive herself and her daughter right through it. Somehow they survive, and she runs into a police roadblock and claims to be taking her daughter to her father's fireproof mansion. The cop, recognizing she's drunk, tells her to turn around and drive back the way she came. So let me get this straight. The police officer just told the drunk woman with a small child in the car to drive through a fire. You know, this is the LAPD, so honestly, that tracks. 
And when young Norma Jean asks why her father never came to see her when he apparently lives nearby, Mama goes cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs and starts beating the shit out of her daughter. Okay, I am already getting Mommy Dearest vibes. If that's what they were going for, nailed it! Norma Jean goes to live with the neighbors after her mother tries to drown her in a bathtub, in case you were wondering how dark this was going to get. There's something wrong with your mother? No, there are many things wrong with her mother. Would you like the full list or just the top ten? But the neighbors almost immediately dump her in an orphanage for reasons that are never really made clear. Not that it matters because we immediately skip over that shit and go straight to adult Norma Jean trying to make it in Hollywood. And that's about it for Mommy Dearest. She's not really part of the story anymore. Apart from a brief visit to a mental hospital, which looks like every cliched mental hospital you've seen in the movies. These are some of our more troubled patients. They're transphobes who saw the recent Doctor Who special. They're not taking it well. Anyway, Norma Jean goes to an audition with someone the movie simply refers to as Mr. Z, likely meant to be Daryl Zanuck, co-founder of 20th Century Fox, who almost immediately gets right to the rapin'. Rape? Attempted murder? This movie has everything! And that leads to a successful Hollywood career for Norma Jean Baker, who adopts the stage name, and later the legal name, Marilyn Monroe. We get some snippets of her acting career, including films like Don't Bother to Knock, Niagara, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, The Seven Year Itch, and Some Like It Hot. She forms a thruple with Charlie Chaplin Jr. and Eddie Robinson Jr., played respectively by Xavier Samuel and Evan Williams, and apparently their thing is they're handsome but kinda stupid. We're the Gemini. The three of us. Like twins. But there's three. Like twins except there's three. If only there was a word for that. And we see her marriage to Joe DiMaggio, played by Bobby Cannavale, who is never referred to by name for some reason. He's simply known as the baseball player. If you didn't know who this was ahead of time, you're gonna have to Google it because the movie can't be bothered. And we see the end of her marriage to DiMaggio because he turned out to be an abusive asshat. Then she marries playwright Arthur Miller, played by Adrian Brody, who is identified by name and also was an abusive asshat. Granted, his abuse was more emotional than physical. But I checked and it turns out emotional abuse is still abuse. I know, I was shocked. And eventually they divorce and she has an affair with JFK, played by Casper Philipson, and not for the first time, talk about getting typecast, and the movie ends with her tragic death due to an overdose at the ripe old age of 36. And an image of Clark Gable welcomes her to a cheaply and hastily rendered heaven that was almost certainly thrown in at the last minute. How did this make it into the movie? There's no way anyone thought that looked good. By the way, there is nothing wrong with your monitor, or, if you're on the toilet, your phone. And I haven't modified any of this footage. This is actually how the movie plays if you watch it on Netflix. It's constantly switching from black and white to color and back again, sometimes within the same scene. The aspect ratio is also inconsistent. It's the old school academy ratio for most of the movie, but sometimes it will change to one of several widescreen ratios and then back to academy and back to widescreen and you get the idea. And again, this can happen multiple times in the same scene, making me wonder if the editor has ADHD. I thought about getting a total count of how many times the aspect ratio and or color changed, but honestly, about halfway through the movie, I just gave up. It wasn't worth the effort. And most of the changes happen with seemingly no rhyme or reason. There is one scene that takes place during the filming of Some Like It Hot where the movie itself is in widescreen, but what happens behind the scenes is in the Academy ratio, and that actually makes sense to a degree. But that's the only time it makes sense. The rest of the changes are completely nonsensical. And those aren't the only puzzling choices made by the director. When Marilyn begins her thruple with the juniors, we get a threesome scene that is initially blurry, which is good for me since I don't have to blur it myself, and then the bed turns into a waterfall which somehow transitions into the movie Niagara. This is the artsiest threesome I have ever seen, at least in an American production, and it's fucking weird. And has some weird fucking. Seriously though, there is some bizarre shit going on in this scene, including this line from Charlie Chaplin Jr., known by the nickname Cass in the movie. I like to watch myself in the mirror. I like to watch myself on the toilet even. That's nice. There's also this moment where Marilyn is attending the premiere of Some Like It Hot, and the movie switches to slow motion while she walks the red carpet for... reasons. Then we go to normal speed when we see the last line of the movie, which is a great line, by the way. And then... What the hell is that? 
I get the feeling Andrew Dominic has a deep appreciation for cinema history and various filmmaking techniques, but I'm not so sure he actually understands them. He made several artistic choices in this movie that appear to have been made purely for the sake of it without any actual artistic vision behind it. So it just comes across as, ooh, look at me, look at how artistic I can be. Ain't I great? This movie is two hours and 46 minutes of Dominic filleting himself. In addition to the weird pseudo-artistic masturbatory nature of this film, it's also important to know that Blonde is a work of fiction, which was made clear by Oates, the author of the book. The people behind the movie insist that while the story is fictional, it remains true to who Marilyn Monroe was. This is what we refer to in scientific terms as a steaming pile of donkey poo. The film is a mixed bag of truth, white lies, and damned lies. Let's start with Marilyn's daddy issues. Marilyn's mother really did show her a picture of Clark Gable and claimed it was her father, though by most accounts Marilyn never actually believed this was true. Throughout the film, she receives several letters from someone claiming to be her father, more on that later, and seems obsessed with meeting him someday. That never actually happened, and as far as I know, she never referred to her lovers as daddy, as she does in the film. That's daddy issues on top of daddy issues. Daddyception? In real life, Marilyn did learn the identity of her actual father, Charles Stanley Gifford, whose parentage was recently confirmed by a DNA test, and even tried to meet him at one point, but he wanted nothing to do with her. F*** him then. Moving on, as an actress, Marilyn is portrayed as the ultimate perfectionist and often required what some might call a ridiculous number of takes to get her scenes right, and was very difficult to work with. By all accounts, this is true, though I get the feeling the depiction of this behavior in Blonde may be a bit exaggerated. I mean, obviously, I wasn't there, so I can't say for sure it's exaggerated, but... I have a hunch. She is also portrayed as helpless and submissive, which does not at all sound like the Marilyn Monroe I've read about, and also contradicts the depiction of her behavior on set. She fought pretty hard for better pay and treatment, founded her own production company, and played a big part in the collapse of the studio system. And yet in the movie, when Mr. Z takes advantage of her, she just bends over and takes it. I find that hard to believe. Granted, Zanuck did have a reputation for being a creep and taking advantage of young actresses, and if there is a hell, I hope he's first in line every morning for the penis flattener. But I don't believe there's any evidence that he raped Marilyn. She was sexually abused as a child and spoke very openly about it at a time when doing so was considered taboo, but to show her being raped as an adult without any evidence that such a thing actually happened to the real Marilyn Monroe feels exploitative. It's adding controversy for the sake of it. Speaking of adding controversy for the sake of it, the thruple with the juniors, that never happened. She did know both of them, possibly in the biblical sense, but not at the same time. The threesome is pure fiction, and it's not even good fiction. At one point in the story, Marilyn, Cass, and Eddie are as thick as thieves, but then the juniors just disappear from the movie without explanation. Their friendship never really ends, it just ceases to exist. But then the juniors suddenly reappear after Marilyn becomes involved with DiMaggio, blackmailing him with some nude photos that Marilyn took before she became famous. And then they're gone again. This scandal involving Marilyn's work as a pinup girl is partly based on reality, but it happened long before she and Joe even met. Hell, her photos had already appeared in Playboy by the time they started dating. Without her consent or compensation, I might add. You're next in line for the penis flattener, Hef. And unlike the movie's portrayal, it wasn't much of a scandal. She claimed she was young and broke and needed the money, the public largely bought it, and that was it. And that makes sense if you think about it for five seconds. Oh, the famous movie star slash blonde bombshell who's known for her sex appeal also looks good naked? Like, that's gonna hurt her popularity. The juniors make one last appearance, or at least Eddie does, near the end of the film. Remember those letters Marilyn supposedly got from her father? After Cass dies, which is interesting considering in real life Marilyn died before him, but anyway, Eddie comes clean and reveals Cass had been the one writing the letters the whole time. This is seriously the big reveal for this subplot with the letters from her father? My expectations were low, but holy shit! Anyway, during her brief marriage to Jolton Joe, the movie gives us a glimpse of Marilyn's inability to cook, which is at least based on reality. She was never going to be the traditional Italian wife Joe wanted. That's partly why their marriage didn't last. That and the fact that he was 10 pounds of dicks in a 5 pound bag. But the movie takes this a bit too far and makes her look like a complete moron. Um, is this to eat? 
You mean standing up? Is the movie trying to suggest that Marilyn had never seen an egg before? Okay, I know she often played the dumb blonde in the movies, but... And I can't believe I have to spell this out. Those were movies. She was acting. That's what actors do. She wasn't actually stupid. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say she definitely knew what an egg was. And despite the movie going all in on the NC-17, it's also seemingly trying to appeal to the religious right. Bear with me on this one. There's a scene with Marilyn praying, which doesn't make much sense considering she identified as an atheist, and they also talk a whole lot about abortion. Early on in the film, it's suggested that Marilyn's father left because he didn't want Gladys to have her. Madam, are you sure it was the child he didn't want? And not your crazy ass? Later, Marilyn is impregnated by one of the juniors, and despite initial excitement at the prospect of having a child, she decides to have an abortion so her career won't be interrupted. She appears to change her mind at the last minute, but is then somehow forced to go through with it? By whom? And how? And why? And what the f*** is going on? This is almost like a parody of what Republicans think happens in California. Which is hilarious considering how many of them live here and should know better. Kevin McCarthy is from Bakersfield. Later on, she's pregnant again by Arthur Miller this time, and... This happens. You won't hurt me this time, will you? Okay. Her unborn child is talking to her. That is se Wait. This time? What do you mean, this time? That was me. It's always me. Yeah, I'm no biologist, but I'm pretty sure that's not how that works. But then she miscarries in a scene that the movie handles with the least amount of class possible, and eventually we get to her affair with JFK, which leads to a fairly graphic fellatio scene, followed by another rapin'. Oh, goody. Assuming their affair actually happened, which we can't say for sure, but it probably did. Was there ever any evidence that it wasn't consensual? This is the first I've heard of it. And after a scene of her on the toilet, we're officially getting into fetish territory now, she has a dream that she's forced into another abortion. Or maybe she was drugged and it wasn't a dream? Who knows? And more importantly, who cares? None of this actually happened. She did have a miscarriage in real life, though not exactly as depicted in the movie, but there is no evidence that she ever had an abortion. Why is this even part of the story? And here's where it gets weird. Er. Believe it or not, Dominic actually stated in an interview with The Rap that the movie is not meant to be anti-abortion. No, for real. I don't think the movie is anti-pro-choice. I don't think it is at all. First, anti-pro-choice. There's a simpler way to say that. And second, you don't think? My brother in Christ, it's your movie. You shouldn't have to think about it. You should know. If you don't, who does? I think there are two possibilities here. Either he's flat out lying for God knows what reason, or, and based on the rest of the movie, I think this is the most likely option, he has no idea what the hell he was trying to say with this movie. Between the random aspect ratio and color changes, bizarre artistic choices, and appealing to the religious right while also making a movie that's borderline pornographic at times, the only way Blonde makes any sense at all is if you assume Andrew Dominic has gone quite mad. It's the only explanation I can come up with for this mess, and I certainly would not say it is true to Marilyn Monroe's legacy. This movie did her dirty. That said, Ana de Armas is pretty good in this. Her accent is a bit off. She tried, but I can still hear a hint of Cuban. But that's the only complaint I have, and like I said before, a bad accent does not necessarily mean a bad performance. In the scenes that are taken from Marilyn's movies, she does a damn near perfect job of mimicking the blonde bombshell. In the other scenes... Well, she's not really playing Marilyn in those scenes, she's playing a woman who just happens to be named Marilyn Monroe, but she does it well. She nails every emotional moment to the best that the script will allow. She's amazing. Even the Razzies, who are known for nominating actors for simply being in bad movies, didn't dare nominate her for Worst Actress. And while he may very well be insane, Andrew Dominic has his moments. Like this scene on an airplane where a drugged-up Marilyn drifts in and out of consciousness and the background shifts between the plane and an adoring crowd. Everything about this scene is brilliant, which makes the rest of the movie all the more frustrating. 
I'm not sure what's worse, the thought that Dominic just accidentally gets something right every once in a while, or the thought that he might have actual talent and knows how to use different filmmaking styles and artistic elements effectively, and then he just didn't for like 90% of the 2 hours and 46 minutes that comprise this godforsaken movie. <sighs> and you know what the damnedest thing is? This isn't the only movie I sat through for this review. Dominic's Blonde is not the first adaptation of Oates' novel. Blonde was originally adapted for TV way back in 2001 as a two-part miniseries that aired on CBS, directed by Joyce Chopra and starring Poppy Montgomery as Marilyn Monroe, along with a pretty good cast that included Patricia Richardson, Patrick Dempsey, Kirstie Alley, Anne Margaret, Wallace Shawn, and Titus Welliver. This is a TV movie cast? Good lord. Both movies tell basically the same story, but approached it in very different ways. The most obvious difference is Chopra's version tells you right off the bat that this is a work of fiction. They're not even trying to pretend that what they're about to show you has any basis in reality. And of course they had to adhere to broadcast TV standards while Netflix imposed no such restrictions on Dominic. There's no nudity in Chopra's version and any sex, consensual or otherwise, is implied rather than shown. We don't even see the affair with JFK and considering how Dominic handled that, I'd say we're better off. We do see Marilyn singing Happy Birthday, Mr. President, but then we skip straight to her death under mysterious circumstances? I guess this is supposed to hint at the ending of the book, which implies Marilyn might have been assassinated? No, really. But without any context, it just sounds weird. What mysterious circumstances? In real life, she was an addict, she OD'd, and she died. Tragic, yes, but not mysterious. Furthermore, the TV version spends a lot more time on young Norma Jean's life before she got into Hollywood, from her childhood to her modeling days, and her first marriage to James Doherty, which Dominic skips over entirely. And that means we see more of Marilyn growing up as a good little Christian girl who won't even let her dates open mouth kiss her, so it's not just Dominic that panders to that crowd. We also get hints of the sexual abuse she suffered as a child, which is kind of hinted at in the Netflix version, but it's a very subtle blink and you miss it moment. And Chopra gives us a lot of talking head segments as if we're watching a documentary of sorts. Unfortunately, a lot of these segments are not very well done. The actors are very stilted and it feels like they were thrown in a room and told, hey, read this real quick. As for Poppy Montgomery, she does a decent job with the role. I think Anna de Armas is a better actor overall, but Poppy feels much closer to the actual Marilyn than Anna. Oh, and remember that line where Cass said he liked to watch himself on the toilet? That line is also present in the TV version, but in a completely different context. It's presented as a joke unlike the Netflix version, which plays it straight and comes across as creepy. I don't know which version is more true to the novel, I honestly haven't read it, but I can tell you which one I prefer, and it ain't the creepy version. In fact, I prefer the TV version of Blonde overall. I don't think either qualifies as a good movie, mainly because I just don't think this is that good a story, and isn't true to the real Marilyn Monroe. But the TV version is better, and I'll tell you why. When you remove the commercials from the TV version, it has about the same runtime as the Netflix version, almost to the minute, and yet it doesn't feel like it. Compared to Dominic's Blonde, which is a chore and a half to sit through, I breezed through Chopra's version. The pacing in Dominic's version could politely be described as deliberate, and honestly described as slow as balls. Chopra does a much better job of moving things along. This really stands out in Marilyn's first meeting with Joe DiMaggio, which is present in both versions with almost the same dialogue. Here's a bit from the TV version. So, how'd you get your start? What start? The movie business, acting. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know. I, um, I was, I was discovered, I guess. I had to do a bit of creative editing to get around YouTube's filters, but that's more or less how the scene plays out. It's about 12 seconds. Now imagine almost the exact same lines of dialogue, filmed in black and white because reasons, and stretched out to almost four times the length with ridiculously long pauses after every sentence, and sprinkled with flashbacks to Marilyn getting raped by Mr. Z because why not? That's Dominic's version. How'd you get your start? What's tart? In movies. In acting. I don't know. I... I... I guess... I guess I was discovered. 
Sometimes I think Dominic's pacing can't possibly get any slower. Was everyone in this movie on Ambien? My god. Anyway, what more can I tell you? Andrew Dominic's Blonde is a long, slow, exploitative, directionless mess of a movie. It doesn't help that the story they had to work with isn't very good in my opinion, but this wasn't the best way to tell it. I know because 21 years prior, someone did it better. Neither version is good enough to be worth your time, but if you must watch one, make it the TV version. It goes by much faster, and it's on the Roku app, which means it's free. It's a no-brainer, really. And after you watch it, watch one of Marilyn's good movies like Some Like It Hot to wash the taste out of your mouth. Well, that's it. We've gone through over 40 years of worst picture winners and come out the other side. Did we learn anything? Eh, probably not, but at least it's over. Now... What the hell am I going to do with myself? Well... Back on my bullshit I go. Fuck Marilyn, she's not here.